Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, episode number 283 for the 23rd of March 2014. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia. Still humid, folks. Oh boy, still muggy. It's the sort of weather that makes you want to move to, well, I don't know, Russia. Which is uh, interesting because today's first guest on the Skeptic Zone is a uh, somebody new on the scene. Well, new to me. Kirill from Moscow. He's going to tell us all about the Russian skeptics and their podcast. And this is a first, a Russian skeptic on the skeptic zone. From Russia with love, we might say, coming up to kick off the show. Following that, it's a week in science from our good friends at the Royal Institution of Australia. Say it all together, folks. You must know it by now. www.riaus.org.au I keep promising to go down there and lounge about the Royal Institution of Australia and make a pest of myself. I'll, uh, I'll make good on that promise one day. But... Can't wait to see what's happening this week in A Week in Science. After that, it's Dr. Rachi reports. What an interesting Dr. Rachi. It's a blast from the past because so much has happened over the years of the Skeptic Zone in relation to the Australian Vaccination Network, or as they call themselves now, the Australian Vaccination Skeptics Network. Um, I thought I would play... From 2009, early 2009, the very first time Dr. Rachie reported on the Australian Vaccination Network. Wow, a blast from the past. Uh, one of the very first Dr. Rachies, well, she was doing reports for a while, but this is the, one of the very first ones where she mentions the Australian Vaccination Network. So, Dr. Rachie reporting from 2009. Then to round off the show, another long-distance interview. I talked to Frank Mosher from the Sacramento Area Skeptics, and he's going to tell us about the upcoming Skeptical. Skeptical. Now, I've been to many uh, skeptical conventions around the world. Skeptical is not one of them. One year I hope to make that. One convention I have been to, twice, very lucky, QED in Manchester in England. That's coming up next month. And I'm delighted, delighted to say that our very own Iran Sergev, reporter on the Skeptic Zone and uh, past president of Australian Skeptics, will be speaking at QED. If you see him there, please run up and say hello. He's a lovely fellow, a really good skeptic who does um, marvellous work for the skeptical organisation and knowledgeable. And uh, if you get a chance to hear him speak, take it. And if you get a chance to go to QED, don't miss it. It's one of the better sceptical conventions around the world. And of course, we can't go on without mentioning the amazing meeting. I am uh, quite flattered to be on the lineup once again this year in Las Vegas. For more information, head to the uh, website of the James Randi Educational Foundation. And I'm also thrilled to bits that uh, a good friend of the sceptical movement, in fact, a former Australian Skeptic of the Year... Dr. Carl Krusiniski will be at TAM this year in Las Vegas with a host of other people. Wonderful lineup. Run to the JREF website, get your tickets as soon as you can, and I'll see you at the amazing meeting. Thank you for all those people who've been writing in with questions. For our good friend Dr. Besh Saab, who is uh, right now locked up in a sort of a Mars simulation in the uh, the desert in Utah. He'll be uh, sending his reply to your questions, hopefully very soon. You know, it takes a long while to get uh, messages back from Mars, and uh, we'll read those out on next week's show. Those people in Sydney, there's still time for you to get your tickets for the upcoming Sydney Skeptics Dinner Talk on the 29th of March, featuring Kat and Joshi talking all about wind farm syndrome. You can get your tickets at skeptics.com.au and there will be a giveaway on that night of another Cosmos uh, prize pack consisting of a Cosmos carry bag, the Cosmos book and some other goodies. Thanks to our friends at the uh, National Geographic channel. And while you're at the, uh, the website of Australian Skeptics, for heaven's sake, 
Book your tickets for the 2014 Australian Skeptics National Convention featuring the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. George Harab, Dick Smith, a Dr. Carl Kuzaniski, indeed, again. Rachel Dunlop will be giving a talk. The list goes on. Get your tickets while they're hot, as they say. Well, it's time for me to run downstairs and gargle more whatever the hell I'm supposed to gargle, because I'm 95% on my way to, to... Getting better after the Nevu cold I got a couple of weeks ago. It's one of those rotten things that really hangs in there, as you can probably hear. Look, will I do that and ponder the universe, as they say? I'll let you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. Russia with love I fly to you Much wiser since my goodbye You know folks, I've been to many places around the world I love travelling to see fellow sceptics in far-fung places like Scotland uh, Even Norway, the United States Wherever I can get to, basically. But, you know, one place I haven't been to is Russia. Mother Russia. And speaking to me from Mother Russia from Moscow uh, to tell us all about the skeptical movement there and some other news, it's Kirill. Hello, Kirill. Hey, Richard. It's really great to talk with you. You know, you're the first guest from Russia. Yeah, it's, it's nice to know, actually, that we're getting out there. Yes, well, you came to my attention uh, via the wonderful Susan Gerbeck, who wrote to me suggesting that you might be someone who I could chat to, and I'm very glad she did. Now, you're in Moscow at the moment, and uh, how's the weather in Moscow? Horrible. <laughs> if, you, if you're the – well, it depends, because if, if you're – if you like snow and uh, sudden cold weather, then you're right. But if you were like two weeks into spring and then suddenly – you wake up and have snow outside your window. Well, <laughs> so I'm a person who waits for summer. I'm the summer guy, so not so good for me. But hopefully they say it's going to be better. Well, we've we've had enough summer here in Sydney, I think I can tell you. I'll send you some summer heat and humidity to, uh, to uh, Russia, and you can send me some nice cool weather down here. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, actually, I have a friend in Australia who said he can swap. I said, yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. I think that's an excellent idea. Now, what can you tell me about the skeptical movement in Russia? And I'll say that I know very little about it, but I do remember seeing, and I think it's online, an, an interesting documentary called Secrets of the Psychics made many years ago where James Randi actually went to Russia. Yeah, I saw that as well. And it was interesting because uh, skeptics uh, movement in Russia basically doesn't exist yet. So... As a movement, I say that we're, like, very, very early on. Uh, right now, and, and it's interesting because we can compare that situation to the English-speaking world, uh, where they started, like, in the 70s, in the 80s, yeah. where Internet was not around. I, and that's my interpretation of why is, that is going on, is that nowadays, by a movement, people typically think that they have to make a website, they have to start posting articles or something. And especially people are taking advantage of social networks. Uh, Facebook or in Russia, the main s network is like Vkontakte. It's like Russian Facebook. And so a lot of the what the so-called movement is on the social networks. So those are uh, groups dedicated to promoting science. Those are groups dedicated to promoting critical thinking. Uh, but... The way I see it, that's not a movement yet because most of these people are not going offline. And the problem that I see here is that most of the skeptical activism is offline. And people go to alternative medicine doctors offline. They are going uh, and doing some religious stuff offline. And so while online is good as an informational carrier, so, so to speak, there is almost zero activity offline. And so when Randy came to Russia, he actually talked to people, you know. That's almost unheard of yet. 
and just we're just making first steps to going offline. And a year ago uh, is basically where we started because tomorrow actually is one year of Skeptic Society of Russia. Uh-huh. Uh, we're not yet like a registered uh, non-commercial organization yet, uh, but we are very much formed, I believe, at this point. Uh, so we're we're the ones who are taking things offline, mostly. That's that's really good to hear, and it's interesting. And you've got me thinking about that documentary too. Now I. I I was fascinated when I saw it originally because Randy went to Russia not long after the, the, the really the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he discovered a lot of mysticism and uh, very strange practices. What's the story like now in Russia? Has, has the scientific method uh, has it become more apparent, or is there still lots of uh, what we might call woo-woo and interesting things going on? Well, in that regard, I think every country in the world is pretty much about the same, that many, many people believe in, like, there is superstition to this or that level. Even if a person is very well educated, I think it's very probable uh, that you will find he believes some woo-woo. And so in Russia, in the beginning of the 90s, there was, like, a surge of New Age uh, stuff, so things that happened in the United States like in the 70s with Uri Geller and all that stuff, in Russia it came over only uh, by the end of 80s and the beginning of 90s. And so many, many New Age healers and people of that sort, uh, they began to have TV time, like they appeared in the media. And today that sort of new wave, that wave has ceased But that's, I think, the difficulty of this, is that it didn't go away. It went on to the Internet. It went on basically from huge TV shows to small TV shows. And so we probably don't have a big New Age name right now or a big psychic. Uh, But we have many, many, many small ones. And we have known psychics in the past also, like, right now, be among the small ones. And those of them who are very popular, they still continue to be popular, and they still continue to gather huge audiences for their meetings and talks, but they're just not as seen as we have seen that before. Just to give you an example, uh, for example, today, a band uh, of Beatles level is hardly possible. But not because uh, we can't produce good music, but because uh, the taste and the technology allows people to listen to so many stuff that it's almost inconceivable that we can have just one band. And so the same has happened with New Age healers. So many of them that it's right now pretty unthinkable that just one of them will pop out. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean... Uh, again, my only frame of reference really is is watching that that documentary. And if listeners want to see that, it is on uh, online on YouTube. Just uh, run a, a Google search for "Secrets of the Psychics," or I think even James Randi and, and uh, Russia should should do it for you, and you can have a look at that. But it does. I do find it interesting. Who are the names anyway in Russia at the moment? Who, who the average Russian may have heard of? Well, one of the guys who has been around a lot in the 90s and who is still around a little bit is Kashpirovsky. So he was the guy who like would put music on and he would speak things and he would sort of hypnotize you and he would say that you will heal and that just from listening to his uh, like broadcasts or if you come over and participate in a broadcast, that that would heal you. And I remember our family actually going to one of those. And I remember just falling asleep. I was a kid back then. (laughs) I don't remember being healed from anything, nor I remember being ill from anything, but, you know. And there there was... Maybe he he healed you of uh, insomnia. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) You, you You could put it that way. Or he could have healed me from an illness previously not known to mankind and not known to me at the moment. So you can, you know, you can never tell. Uh, the other great guy who's still around and who uh, who still does a lot of very funny things is Alan Chumak. And uh, he is, uh, I think he is one of the, uh, how to put it, unique people 
uh, he was actually able to fill his uh, he he could fill his broadcast with just silence. So his idea was that uh, I will now heal you. All you have to do is just sit before the TV screen, and I will just start moving my hands around. Just don't look at me. Just feel what's going on with your body. And so I think that that's a great psychological device to sort of allow people to make up things for themselves. And then for like about seven, eight, ten minutes, he would sit there in total silence and just make passes with his hands as if he's doing something. And uh, watching those videos right now, I'm like fascinated. I mean, that's so artistically well put. That's like so (laughs) wonderfully done. And that actually works. <laughs> I mean, I understand how that could work. Uh, and people today, people who are otherwise very intelligent people, will tell me that, well, you know, I have statistics that show that during his uh, broadcasts, there was very little emergency calls to doctors. <laughs> However, the doctors themselves say, yes, sure, this is a real statistic. But about an hour after his broadcasts, the emergency calls would just peak. That's interesting. Um, and, and you make a very interesting point there about people sort of being people uh, more or less the same all around the world. We're seemingly intelligent people. Uh, some of them can, can really believe in this, no matter what it is. If it's some guy sitting on the TV waving his hands or broadcasting silence, no matter what it is, I guess we're not all that different after all. Sure, not in that regard, that's, that's for sure. I mean, the brain is the brain. Yeah, it's no matter where you are in the world. Now, I've ha- just having a look at your website at the moment, and if folks want to have a visit, the the uh, URL is very easy. Just type in just type in skepticsociety.ru. It's in Russian, but you click the English button, and suddenly it pops up in English. And I noticed that you've got a podcast. That's right. Uh, we're doing that podcast like almost for a year, but it's like about nine months. It's a weekly podcast called Skeptic. And it's, uh, it's about skepticism and science. And just uh, for, for anybody who really wants to listen to that kind of stuff, for any, any Russian-speaking skeptic. And so, so, far, so as far as we know, it's the only regular podcast dedicated to skepticism in Russia. So, or should I say the Russian-speaking world? That's not. I'm, deli- I'm delighted to learn <laughs> about that because I love to promote uh, other podcasts and other groups from around the world. I'm running promotions for podcasts from Ireland, from Norway, from France, other places around the world, the United States, of course, Canada. Now I can add Russia to the list. I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. Yeah, actually, we also love to promote podcasts in Russia. Like, hey, guys, we don't want to be the only podcast. We want to live in a world where there are thousands of podcasts dedicated to skepticism. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's also, of course, very good to be the first ones. Uh, so it's yeah. And also the podcast is a very, very good device to build a community because imagine a person who became a skeptic recently and he is uh, he, he really is surrounded by people who are not interested or maybe who believe a lot of superstitious a lot of supernatural things. And so he's able to put that podcast on and like hear people who think the same way he does. And I think that that really unites people. So a podcast was a project that I knew we had to do very early on. And so we're doing that and we're enjoying that. And as being a host of a podcast allows you to learn a lot of things. Oh, it certainly does. I can vouch for that. I'm also... Interested to see on your website, you have a collection of uh, videos as well. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, when I started making that website like a month ago, and so it's a very new website, uh, we decided, just as I told earlier, we decided to move away from social networks and sort of uh, build a website which is like more static HTML and something that people would find through uh, Google. Uh, So I think that that information should stay uh, on a static website rather than, you know, like the news feed of a social network. And so once having done the website, I was 
was amazed that we had actually during this year we produced a lot of things, and videos are one of them. We started doing videos like in autumn, and you know that's like uh, very new things. Like uh, a young society, which began to produce videos and we're like very happy about it, making those first steps. But yeah, so we're doing. We've made some short videos, short clips. You know, like similar to Big Think, just speaking yeah. about things and uh also we began to do a, a little bit like the same thing as a podcast but in video format it's not regular though because as you probably a podcaster yourself you know that if you're producing something regularly it has to be easy enough to be feasible for a long time and so uh, doing an audio podcast weekly is challenge enough so we thought that if we were ever to make video podcast weekly we would first of all have to give up the audio podcast and we would also have to have some staff that would help us out because right now i'm the only one producing doing the production work and that's kind of tough <laughs> i think you sound like the russian richard saunders to me uh, yay <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I know what you're saying because I used to uh, this show before it became an audio podcast was actually a video show and that was um, that took up so much time but I in the six years I've been doing this show I I think audio is better because people can listen to it in their cars and on the train or jogging or walking the dog or cleaning their bathroom or or whatever they're doing so I, I like the podcast format but I'm delighted to see all the things on your website the video collection is is quite interesting you've got lectures and debates and short clips and things like that. And uh, do you actually get together with your fellow skeptics in Russia? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's I think that's the trademark of the beginning of skeptical movement is that we have we hold biweekly meetings, and that's how the Skeptic Society has uh, was started. Uh, and those meetings uh, are held in Moscow currently. We're also trying to organize meetings in other cities, and we have two other cities trying to do that as well right now. So yeah, biweekly meetings, and we have like about thirty. Sometimes in 40 people coming over. Uh, listen, I'm delighted to, to discover your organization and your podcast. Uh, I hope that uh, you get lots more people interested now all around the world, the Russian-speaking people who might hear about it via the Skeptic Zone. And uh, all I can do is wish you uh, every success, and we'll catch up in the not-too-distant future to see how things are going. Great, great. Thanks a lot for the entry. From Russia with love. Raz, dva, tri, čtyri. Друзья, меня зовут Кирилл Алферов, и я основатель общества скептиков. Мы зовем вас на наши встречи, которые проходят каждые две недели в Москве, и также приглашаем послушать наш подкаст, который выходит каждую неделю. Подкаст называется «Скептик», а сайт, на котором вы можете узнать о нашей деятельности, это www.skepticsociety.ru. Hey, everybody, my name is Kirill, and I'm the founder of Skeptic Society Russia. Come visit us in Moscow in our bi-weekly meetings, and also listen to our weekly podcast, which is called «Skeptic». And the site where you can find all of that is skepticsociety.ru. Welcome to A Week in Science from RIOZ, bringing you the science you need to know. Diets seem to fall in and out of fashion on a regular basis, making it hard to pick fact from fiction. First, let's look at the intermittent fasting principle, which inspired the popular 5-2 diet. Basically, you eat normally for five days of the week and eat just 500 to 600 calories on the other two days. That's equal to just porridge with fruit for breakfast and vegetable soup for dinner. Studies using rodents have shown that a restricted calorie diet can help increase lifespan, protect against cognitive decline like dementia, and possibly protect against diabetes. But these results haven't been shown in humans. In fact, a 2011 UK study found that intermittent fasting showed no greater weight loss or health benefit than a normal low-calorie diet. Fasting also tends to make people overeat on normal days, 
and can lead to side effects such as dehydration, extreme tiredness and anxiety. Next, let's talk about the popular juice cleanse diet, which was the second most Googled in 2013. The idea is that you just drink fruit and vegetable juices for up to a week, aiming to detox your body and kickstart weight loss. It works out to about 1,000 calories a day, making it another starvation diet, which accredited dietitians think are a terrible idea. Juice diets also claim that liquefying your food helps you to absorb nutrients more easily, giving your guts a rest. There is absolutely no scientific evidence to back these claims. In fact, juicing eliminates valuable antioxidants from the fruit skin and removes fibre which is essential for good digestion. And now, for diet detox facts. Australians are expected to spend $6.6 billion on the weight loss industry in the 2013-2014 financial year. There is no evidence that detox diets do anything. Our liver, skin, intestines and kidneys already filter waste products effectively, making it a bit of a sham. A 2007 study found that nearly 30% of food ads carried health claims that weren't allowed under current food standards. And beware, almost anyone can claim they are a dietitian or nutritionist in Australia, as they're not legally protected titles. If you want a university qualified professional, look for an accredited practicing dietitian. That's it for this week in science. For more information on diets and detox, go to the RIAUS website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. I'm Kieran Groom, and we'll catch you next week. You've argued against the same woo so many times you can do it in your sleep. Quit trying to stop the nonsense one person at a time. Join Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Help us make sure the best skeptical information is always at everyone's fingertips. We need writers, editors, translators. We need you. And take as much or as little time as you can give us. Help us make Wikipedia as accurate as it can be. And you'll literally be helping people while you sleep. To join us or find out more, send a Facebook friend request to Susan Gerbic. That's G-E-R-B-I-C. Gorilla Skepticism. The time is now. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Rachie Reports. With recent talk about how the anti-vaccine crowd have affected rates of vaccination in the UK and the States, I thought it might be interesting to look closer to home to see how Australia stacks up. This week, Medicare, which is Australia's government-run health body, released figures from the Australian Childhood Immunisation Register, which details the rate of immunisation in Australia. The latest figures are from December 2008, and on the face of it, it seems we are doing pretty well. For kids aged up to 15 months, the national average for immunisation is 91%, with the lowest levels being 89.9% for Western Australia. The national average falls to 88.4% in the up to five years old group, with the lowest compliance of 85.5% in South Australia. But when you consider that approximately 90% vaccination is needed to obtain herd immunity, however this depends on the vaccine and the disease, these figures are encouraging. Now Rob Menzies from the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance said that in some cases where there are low vaccination rates, these are often more prevalent where well-educated parents did their own research and believed the myths that vaccines did more harm than good. And this was reflected in figures for Sydney's exclusive eastern suburbs, which includes the Harbour View well-to-do suburbs of Double Bay and Vaucluse. Now, these were ranked the worst, with only 80% of children in these areas being immunised. And this was followed closely by the areas of Lismore, Alstonville and Byron Bay, which are areas known for their alternative lifestyles. So this is not a big surprise. Now, since these figures have been released, there has been much discussion and speculation about why the wealthy suburbs are seemingly less likely to get their kids vaccinated. One journalist described the parents as selfish dummy mummies needing their conscience pricked. (laughs) 
Adele Horan doesn't beat around the bush. She reported in the Sydney Morning Herald that these are women who spend too many hours on wacky internet health sites and become convinced that immunisation is a great conspiracy. She further described these parents as the educated mother who thinks she knows better than the overwhelming majority of the world's scientists and doctors. And as you can imagine, she received some pretty nasty letters the following day. She also said this, Around the world, resistance to vaccination is strongest amongst the affluent and educated. These statements are supported by Arthur Allen, author of the book Vaccine, A History of Immunisation. He observed that living in a place with a high percentage of PhDs is a risk factor for whooping cough. Scathing stuff indeed. But in a case of backward logic, the anti-vaxxers have actually claimed this for themselves, loudly proclaiming, Parents continue to be accused of being ignorant, uncaring and stupid for refusing vaccines, which the medical community claim will keep their children healthy, when the truth is older, highly educated parents form the basis of the anti-immunisation lobby. Not something to be proud of, I would have thought. However, one wonders if these are the parents glued to morning television, where the likes of Meryl Dory from the Australian Vaccination Network can regularly be seen spouting her misinformed anti-vax nonsense. Yes, people, we have our own version of Jenny McCarthy in Australia. We are not immune. Now, the innocuously titled Australian Vaccination Network, fronted by the screeching Meryl Dory, go by the catchphrase, Love them, protect them, never inject them. She is regularly given a platform on morning television shows in Australia, such as Mornings with Kerry Ann Kennelly. In defence of Kerry Ann Kennelly, they usually have a representative from the sensible side, in this case, Dr. Penny Adams. However, just like the overseas breeds, Meryl is not shy about exposing her ignorance to a national audience. Well, Meryl, what's wrong with vaccination? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea of vaccination, but unfortunately there isn't a whole lot of science to back it up. Dr. Penny said that if we get enough people vaccinated, we'll see the diseases wiped out. Well, sorry, could I just, yes. and I don't want to seem to interrupt, but you say no. not enough science to back it up. I'm a lay person. I sure. just know this information says we've been polio free since 2000. That, to me, says there's a bit of science that polio vaccinations work. Need I say more? However, as a further demonstration of how little the Australian Vaccination Network understand about science and medicine, I will use an article written by them known as 10 Reasons Why Not to Vaccinate. Reason 1. Vaccines have never been tested. This statement encompasses the full gamut of how little the Australian Vaccination Network know about how the drug development process works. I won't bore you with the details of this today, but I will tell you it takes millions of dollars, around 10 years, and at least four phases of testing, which continues even after the drug is released. Evidence that this process works can be found in the case of a vaccine for the rotavirus called Rotashield, which was released in the US in 1998. In pre-licensure trials, the vaccine appeared to be safe, but in post-licensure surveillance, it was associated with an increased risk of intersusception, which is a rare form of bowel obstruction occurring in infants. As soon as this problem was discovered, the vaccine was withdrawn from the market and Rotashield was never released in Australia. Number two, vaccines contain toxic additives and heavy metals. Well, here the AVN are, of course, scaremongering with thimerosal, which is the mercury-based preservative that has been used in very small amounts in some vaccines since the 1930s to prevent bacterial and fungal contamination. But there is no evidence that thimerosal has caused any health problems, except perhaps minor reactions, such as redness at the injection site. In any case, thimerosal was removed from childhood vaccines as a precaution in 2000. And some vaccines, such as pneumococcal vaccines, the MMR, and other live attenuated viral vaccines, never contained thimerosal. Whilst there are certain vaccines for adults in Australia that still contain thimerosal, the levels are extremely low, much lower than the level of exposure we obtain to mercury in our daily lives. I don't have the time or energy to discuss all the claims made by the Australian Vaccination Network in this article. 
except to say that they are full of accusations and conspiracies we have come to expect from these people. These include such gems as the pharmaceutical companies have paid for all the vaccine studies to date, therefore they are flawed. And then there's this extraordinary claim. Some childhood illnesses have beneficial aspects and therefore prevention may not necessarily be in the interests of the child. You really think so, Meryl Dory? Well, why don't we use one example of a childhood illness, whooping cough, which can be vaccinated for, and look at whether it's in the interest of the child to contract it. I choose whooping cough since Australia is currently experiencing an epidemic. Now, according to some reports, more than 8,300 cases were reported in New South Wales last year. In October 2008, 40 cases were reported from the same school, and the health service said that most of these cases were in children who had not been immunised. Whooping cough is caused by the bacterium Bordetella pertussis. Babies are vaccinated against whooping cough at two months, then boosted at four months, six months and four years. A booster dose is also recommended for adolescents and certain adults such as healthcare workers and those who work with young babies. In young children, whooping cough is particularly serious, where one in every 200 babies who contract the infection will die. Some can even crack their ribs through violent coughing attacks. A recent report about the epidemic cited the story of a 14-week-old girl who has had whooping cough since she was two weeks old. Her terrified mother said she had turned blue several times during coughing fits as she gasped for air. Whooping cough is not a disease you want to mess with. It causes considerable morbidity. The disease is particularly serious in small children as it can cause them to stop breathing. The whoop, which is not always obvious, is due to a deep breath at the end of a bout of coughing, and vomiting after coughing is common. Severe complications, which occur almost exclusively in unvaccinated people, include seizures and pneumonia. In babies under six months of age, the symptoms can be severe or life-threatening and include hemorrhage, apnea, which is when you stop breathing for short or long periods of time, pneumonia, inflammation of the brain, convulsions and coma, permanent brain damage and death. According to health officials in New South Wales, the recent epidemic of whooping cough is likely a result of a reduction in vaccination. The North Coast Area Health Service Director of Public Health, Paul Corbin, said, Communities with low vaccination rates have had more than eight times the rate of disease seen in those areas with the highest vaccination rates. Well, according to the Australian Vaccination Network, you don't need to vaccinate against whooping cough. Sometimes it's better for kids to just catch it. And although this organisation is relatively small, they do have a lot of influence and are also well organised and very active. Australian listeners may remember the case of parents who fled hospital and the authorities with their newborn boy in August 2008 to avoid having to have him vaccinated for hepatitis B. The sad thing was the mother was hepatitis B positive herself. And although it is not compulsory to be vaccinated in Australia, it is health department policy that children born of hepatitis B positive mothers are offered immunoglobulin for the child within 12 hours of birth and four doses of the vaccine over six months. In a tragic tale of ignorance, the mother told reporters that the couple believed aluminium in the vaccine could cause him more damage than the child contracting hepatitis B. And of course, the father is a member of the Australian Vaccination Network, by which the couple are now touted as heroes. Australia also has the usual suspects, such as the chiropractors who don't proclaim it from the rooftops, but upon questioning will tell you not to vaccinate. They will also follow the MMR autism line, and I had one tell me this at a recent Mothers, Babies and Pregnancy Expo. And of course, we can't forget the despicable homeopaths, who will also tell you on the sly that you can use homeopathy to vaccinate your kids. I won't discuss this further today because A, it makes me too angry, and B, it requires its own show entirely. For more information about the myths and realities of vaccination, the Australian government publishes a brochure called Vaccination Myths and Realities, Responding to Arguments Against Immunisation. 
This is a thoroughly researched and easy to read resource which addresses fact and fiction about immunisation. It's also useful even if you are not in Australia and particularly good for passing the way of anyone you know who might have some dodgy ideas about the merits of vaccination. For further reading and the references for this story, head to my blog, which is linked from skepticzone.tv. And thank you to everyone who has been emailing me and leaving comments on the blog. Also, don't forget I have another blog at skepticsbook.com. And until next time, this has been Dr. Rachie Reports. Og jeg er Kristin, og vi vil tipse dig som norsk lytter av The Skeptic Zone om skeptikermiljø i Norge. Det finns norske blogger og pubtreff og podcast, og foreningen Skepsis driver med ulike former for aktivisme. Centralt er skepsis.no, og her publiseres det dypt pløyende artikler, en kalender over skeptiske aktiviteter og lenker til andre skeptiske resurser. Skepsis-bloggen oppdateres jevnlig, og det diskuteres heftig på Skepsis-forumet, så stikk innom og delta du også. Skepsis.no Hello, I'm Marit. And I'm Kristin, and we want to let you know that there are lots of Norwegian skeptics for you to get to know. There are blogs and pub meets and a podcast, and the Norwegian skeptics also do paranormal tests and consumer activism. To find out more, Google Norwegian skeptics or visit skepsis.no. me now on the line from Sacramento and that's a place I haven't been to yet I hope to get there one day it sounds like an interesting place it's the president of the Sacramento skeptics Frank Mosier hello Frank hello Richard it's a pleasure to be on the skeptics oh thank you very much it's great to to, uh, to catch up with you I I can't remember if we've met over the years in one of these many skeptical conventions and goings on I'm pretty sure we haven't. I haven't had a chance to go to any of the larger events yet. And actually, I am relatively new to skepticism. I discovered uh, skepticism about four years ago, and it's really changed my life. I'm very passionate about it. Oh, it's the old story. <laughs> watch out. Watch out. You're in for a wild ride, I think, at times. Uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting, um, what can we say, aspect of life. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. And you meet some very interesting people. And uh, what's? can you tell our listeners a little bit about the Sacramento Skeptics? What's that scene like? Well, the Sacramento Area Skeptics, we were launched by uh, Shane Trimmer in 2008. And we've largely been just a social gathering with our skeptics in the pub and so on. And uh, we, we started uh, coordinating with the Bay Area Skeptics to put on Skeptical a few years ago, which is very, very exciting and then i'm also i've started launching a few more things we have skeptics in the park now and we'll have skeptics in the pool hall and skeptics in the bowling alley and just all (laughs) sorts of community things i'm really trying to build that community that that place for people to to come together and and talk and uh you know that that whole that feeling of being part of something skeptics in the park that sounds interesting. I've certainly been to plenty of skeptics in the pub in my time. What's skeptics in the park all about? Skeptics in the park is just about going to local area parks. We we've had them at a we did we just had our second one a few weeks ago, and uh, we're just going to different area parks and bring kids. It doesn't have to be kids. It's not only family, but it's definitely family friendly. And it's just about getting outdoors during the day, a slightly different scene from the skeptics in the pub. There are a lot of people who really can't make it to the skeptics in the pub, and that's maybe that's not their thing or they have kids or whatnot. But the skeptics in the park allows for that different – uh, that different environment to get together. What a great idea. What a great idea. Bring a sandwich or two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, a, a, picnic, a nice beverage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's been exciting so far. And in California, we have uh, such great weather most of the time that I think for most of the year, it should be a, a quite a fun event. Yes. Why not? Why not indeed? I think it's not, not such a bad idea. Maybe I might see about... Uh, 
skeptics in the park day here in Sydney. It might be a, a, a great idea. And if people are listening in the Sacramento area, what's the website they should uh, go to to find out more information? Well, there's a few different ways they can find out more information, either on Facebook under Sacramento Area Skeptics uh, or on Meetup under Sacramento Area Skeptics. And then I've just recently launched uh, www.sacareaskeptics.com, so S-A-C-Area-Skeptics.com, all one word. And uh, all of those, those uh, resources have our events listed along with quite a few other things. Yes, that website is www.sacareaskeptics.com. S A C A R E A S K E P T I C S dot com Sac Area Skeptics and there's the oh it's beautiful lovely uh, picture of uh, Sacramento you've got information something about skepticism and a contact button that's the place to go to folks if you're in the area and you want to find out more but Frank I'm really keen to find out more myself about Skeptical and Skeptical is a uh, a gathering. It's one of the few gatherings I think I haven't yet attended. Can you tell me something about that? Sure. Uh, Skeptical is the Northern California Conference of Science and Skepticism, and it's a day-long event. We have speakers, we have panels, discussions. Uh, it varies a little bit from year to year, uh, but uh, it's a ton of fun. We we have so many different people coming from all over Northern California. We have uh, phenomenal speakers. We've this year, I'm really excited about uh, Paul Doherty speaking about the boundaries of science. He comes from uh, the uh, Exploratorium in San Francisco. And then uh, Dan Dugan uh, talking about a, a federal lawsuit to stop public funding for uh, Waldorf schools. And we also have uh, Andy Fracknoy who's going to be talking about uh, astrologers and astronomy and uh, some history there with that. And uh, quite a quite a few more. The the Skeptical website lists all of our speakers. I'm having a hard time deciding which one I'm more excited about. <laughs> uh, now, what is the website, by the way, for that? The website is www.skepticalcon.com. Uh, S k e p t i c a l c o n dot com. Right. That's the website to go to. And where exactly is it going to be held? Uh, this year, it's going to be at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center uh, in uh, in Oakland, California, at 388 uh, 9th Street. Uh, previous years, we've had it at the Double Tree in Berkeley, but we moved it to uh, the Oakland Asian Cultural Center this year. We're very excited about it. Should have a lot of really great food options nearby too, which uh -huh. is one of my favorite things about yeah about going to the Bay Area. There's so much wonderful food there. Oh, there is. Oh, I can vouch for that, folks. There certainly is. Is that not too far from the National Center for Science Education. That's actually very close to the National Center for Science mm. Education. Yes. And uh, my co-chair for the Skeptical uh, Planning Committee is uh, Dr. Eugenie Scott, of, uh, now now retired as the executive director there. I'm sure lots of listeners are very well – are very familiar with her. Oh, absolutely. And with uh, Jeannie Scott on your organization, you can't go wrong, I think. She's a – She's a champion, a, a wonderful uh, promoter of science and has been for, for many, 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 many years. And uh, whenever oh, I'm yeah. in the area, I always try to catch up with Eugenie Scott, of course. And what was that date again, the exact date and time? The exact date is uh, May 31st, and we should start about 9 a.m., and we should be uh, finishing up. Uh, the last the last uh, speaker will be some entertainment, actually, should finish up around 6 p.m., and uh, people like to uh, move around and talk a little bit after that. So about 9 to 6.30 is, uh, is the range of that. Right, May 31st for the people in the Bay Area, in uh, the, the San Francisco Bay Area and surrounding areas and even interstate. Uh, this would be a great one-day skeptical gathering to get to in uh, Oakland. Uh, if I could, if I could invent a, a teleporter, I'd be there myself. It, it is a little difficult. It is a little difficult to get to all these things from Sydney, Australia. I do my best. I must say, Frank, I, I really try. I really do my best. And one year, I am bound to make skeptical. And I know that's been going for some years. You must be really looking forward to it this year. Oh, I'm extremely excited. I look forward to it all year long. It's so much fun to meet uh, so many skeptics from all over the state and listen to such wonderful speakers. And 
it, it really is fantastic. Do you uh, do you know if there are any plans to uh, capture some of the talks or report on some of the talks? Uh, we do actually. We do have plans to capture those on video and audio. Uh, I'd like to make those available. Uh, in the past, uh, we haven't always uh, gotten those, but I, I'd really like to make those available this year, and we do have plans to make that available this year. Oh, that's good news. That's good news because if people uh, can't make it, they can always sort of catch up later on. It's good to do that. But, folks, let me tell you, there's nothing better than being at one of these things in the flesh, in person, in the audience, and you get to chat to all these wonderful people. Frank, a pleasure to catch up with you, to meet you, virtually meet you, as it were. I hope that we can uh, meet up sometime uh, before long in one of these interesting skeptical conventions or one of our adventures. But for now, uh, Frank Mosher from the wonderful Sacramento area, which I hope to visit one day. Thank you for being on the Skeptic Zone. Thank you very much, Richard. The pleasure was definitely mine. Großes Hallo an alle deutschen Zuhörer des Skeptic Zone Podcasts. Wusstet ihr, dass es auch in Deutschland einen Skeptikerverband gibt? Für weitere Informationen über uns und das Skeptiker Magazin besucht www.gwup.org. Ich wiederhole www.gwup.org und unsere offiziellen Facebook, Twitter und Google Plus Seiten. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. So many things to remember on this week's show. And so many conventions coming up. There's QED in Manchester, the amazing meeting in Las Vegas, and of course the Australian Skeptics National Convention right here in Sydney. If you can get to all three, well done. But for now it's time for me to uh, run back downstairs and just sit on the couch and rest the old vocal cords. I think that's probably a good idea. Might even watch uh, the latest episode of Cosmos. I am enjoying that series. I really am. Oh, I enjoyed it uh, nearly 30 years ago, too. But for this week, for now, this is Richard Saunders, signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports.